Aaron Apke, my team told me a couple of things about you. So I know why this is going to be an incredible conversation. Um, however, in 30 seconds or less, why should they listen to this episode till the very end? Because we're going to teach them how to get into their heart, out of the mind, into the heart, mind, heart coherence. Um, I think is one parallel we both have in our teachings that I really enjoy when I listen to your teachings that I'm like, hey, he's saying the same stuff. <laughs> so we'll get into it. It's going to resonate. Yeah. How, tell us a little bit about your story. How did this journey begin back to your heart? And, and, and you know what, maybe even before that, you know, I think so many people hear me say that, mm -hmm. but I know that 10 years ago, even five years ago, if I would have heard someone say, return to your heart, I would have been like, yeah. what is he talking about? Meaningless. What does that mean? Yeah. Well, you know, it almost like it's harder to define the more you teach it in a way, because it's this infinite mystery of being in the heart, living from the heart. Um, but, you know, if I have to like give it a succinct definition, it's being able to, to live in a loving relationship with all things or to be in loving relationship to all things. <clears throat> That's been the, the framework that helps me to not only teach, but comprehend myself. What am I really trying to say to the world here? Mm -hmm. It's if enlightenment is anything to me, it's being able to live from such a place that you are in a loving relationship with everything, not just other people, but with your own mind, with your own body, with the food you eat, with everything, right? Am I in a loving relationship or a dysfunctional, um, clingy relationship, attachment, uh, resentment? Like those are unloving relationships. And we're engaged in those kinds of relationships in all kinds of places that we're not necessarily aware of. Mm -hmm. So when getting into the heart makes us aware of the unloving relationships we're engaging in and allows us to come back to a place of balance and harmony in all our relationships. And that's what love is. Beautiful. And, and, and I say beautiful because I know why that's so important for someone's life. I know what that could do for someone's life. Why would it be important for someone listening, right? You know, as, as, as a matter of fact, maybe they're, they're struggling in life right now. Um, their, their, their relationship with a partner isn't working. Their relationship with money isn't working. Heck, their, their, their body is constantly in stress and pain. Why is returning to the heart such an important conversation to have? Mm -hmm. Well, I always have a lot of benefit from trying to understand the way the universe really is, the way it really works, you know, the, the laws, the law structure of reality. And in terms of like the evolution of consciousness, which is a subject of great interest to me there, you know, we can kind of put it into three camps if we had to, in terms of how consciousness evolves. And that would be like simple consciousness of the animal or insects. There's then self-consciousness of human beings, at least on this planet exclusively. And then the third camp is what we call cosmic consciousness, which is where you go beyond the personal identity and realize I'm actually a universal self, or I actually belong to the whole universe. And returning to the heart is what shifts you from that second phase of consciousness, self-consciousness, which we call ego, mm -hmm. being obsessed with myself, my story, my needs. That's what's important to me. That's where all suffering exists, ironically, right? It actually doesn't exist in simple consciousness in the animal kingdom because animals don't have that self-referencing kind of mechanism in the mind where they can um, think about themselves the way a human does and fear the future and regret the past and all those things. That's only, that only exists in self-consciousness. And that's where, you know, 99% of people live. And so the, the only salvation- Is it, is, is, is it that high? It's, I, I, I think it's I, a, yeah, I think it's at least 99% in terms of like, who's really living from cosmic consciousness. Yeah. It's still very rare on our planet. Yeah. And some of us are living in, you know, one foot in each camp. We're getting there. Yeah, we're, we're merging there. So it's not like you are or you're not. It's a spectrum of evolution, right? But like who's truly living in cosmic consciousness, 99.9% .9 of people aren't. It's very, yeah. But we, our planet will get to a place maybe in 5,000 years or something where 100% of people will live from that state of consciousness. That'll be the normal operating mode, right? But we're not there yet. Right. We're still in self-consciousness or the, uh, the third chakra, which is the ego chakra. So what I really am passionate about teaching, much like yourself, is how to teach people how to make that 
ascension from the third to the fourth energy center to where your consciousness doesn't live here anymore, just in the ego mode, but you now live from this chakra, the heart chakra, and that is where you start to enter that cosmic consciousness because the heart opens up the awareness of oneness, right? That's the unique aspect that the, the heart chakra allows consciousness to access. Before the heart chakra is activated, when humans are living from only the third center, we literally don't have the capacity to perceive that we're connected. We, we viscerally feel that we're separate. And so you're an enemy, you're a threat to me, I need to oppose you, defeat you. And that's where all suffering lives, right? So the only salvation is actually getting out of that chakra and ascending higher to the fourth energy center. And that's actually also, according to the law of one, which is a text that I love and teach, that's also the kind of graduation point for the soul in this realm. Meaning the universe is waiting to see when the soul reaches that green ray heart chakra level. Is this being living from their heart more than their ego? then they're eligible to graduate to the next level of consciousness after this life. So you don't have to keep coming back here and repeating the same grade over and over again. Yeah. So there's a million reasons why it's important, but for, from a wider context, those are the reasons that matter the most to me. I absolutely love all of this. Absolutely love all this. So grateful that you're here right now because I think this is a conversation that humanity needs to hear. Um, it's so interesting that you brought that up. I, I, I want to share really quickly a story about when my heart chakra opened, which I didn't even know was a thing, mm -hmm. um, and how that relates and confirms everything that you're saying. Epic. We were in Costa Rica. We were at an ayahuasca retreat, and we're sitting down for dinner, a group of us. And um, I was talking back then about um, opening up an ayahuasca center. And uh, I was gonna take them to a piece of land to show it to them. And little by little in that dinner, um, uh, they all started sharing their ideas. Well, you know, it's gotta, you know, make sure it's not on a hill because people aren't gonna like walking up the hill. Uh, make sure that, you know, it has uh, organic food or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be, right? And they all started sharing their ideas with me. And I, in that moment, I thought, oh my God, I get it. Like, I can't do this all by myself. And everything I've ever done in my life, I've done it all by myself because everyone has been my competitor. Mm -hmm. Like whether I want to admit yeah, that or yeah, not, yeah. like that's where I was living. Yeah. And I was like, wow, that's wild. And it's, I got it, right? I go home that very night, I lay down in bed and I just started to feel this. And I, I go like this because there was like this warmth in here, right? And I thought, wow, that's kind of weird. And it started really small, like a pebble. Hmm. And then that warmth kind of started growing and it started reaching all across my entire chest. And I, <sighs> my heart chakra is opening. And this was a new sensation. You had I have never, never felt this in my life, but the only reason why I was able to actually feel it, like physically feel it, was because I had experienced my root chakra opening. Mm -hmm. And I experienced that physical feeling. I just find it very, very interesting that it came right after I thought to myself, I get it, like I need their help, right? Mm. So I have a question for you. If somebody is listening to this, right, and, um, and, and they're listening and they're going, okay, this is like, this is making me sense, mm -hmm. making sense. Maybe this is a little uncomfortable. Maybe I don't know a, lot, a little bit about this, but for people living in that second energy, in the energy or the frequency of self, could you give me examples of what their life could look like right now that maybe could resonate with them? Mm -hmm. Well, if you're living from self-consciousness, ego consciousness, third energy center, solar plexus, it's the classic, you know, I'm obsessed with me and my story. I live from a place where the world, the universe feels like it revolves around me. Feels like I'm the most important person in the room when I walk in. Feels like everybody should care about my needs more than their own and this and that. And these are subtle things, right? They're not always at the forefront of someone's mind. But if you really get honest with yourself about how do I feel when I'm around others, when I walk into a room, 
uh, in ego consciousness, there is a very visceral feeling of like, I'm the most important person in this room. And that's what produces suffering because every identity the mind creates, um, I'm this person, I'm attractive, I'm funny, I'm smart, whatever the identity is, it becomes this like bullseye target, right? That you have to constantly protect and defend because then anyone who might appear smarter than you or funnier than you or more attractive than you is a threat, a threat to you, right? And so you're going to feel insecure, nervous, upset, jealous. And that's just one of the ways that ego creates our suffering. And so there's this attachment aversion pattern, which is notorious of ego consciousness in that we talked about loving relationship. The only two relationships the ego can have with anything is attachment or resistance. It cannot have a balanced loving relationship because the ego always needs something. Mm. It needs to get fulfillment or it needs to avoid pain. I love that. I love that. How do people, right? So that so that we become aware, how do people that live in, you know, that ego relationship and the need to to how, how does that show up? Could you could you give me an example, like a real world example of that? Of how it shows up? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, let's take <clears throat> romantic partnerships are always one of the best places to look at. Mm -hmm. Those tend to be the the playground where ego shows up the most tangibly, right? And in a in a romantic relationship, um, are you familiar with A Course in Miracles? I, I, you know, it's something I have obviously heard of time and time again. Yeah, yeah. But I have never okay engaged. Yeah. So the course calls it the special relationship, um, which is the ego's version of love, and it means like I need you to make me feel special. I'm with you because when I'm with you, I feel more special about myself um, you, because you're attractive. You're this. You're that. Nobody dates someone that they think isn't attractive, isn't successful, isn't this or that. You date someone you think the ego believes has desirable qualities, right, that are going to enhance you. And so I'm really only with you because you make me feel better about myself. You make me look better. Um, I don't feel so alone with myself. But it's not like I'm really here because I genuinely love you as a being and want to serve you and bless you. It's really all about me secretly, right? And we know that because in the honeymoon phase, everything looks like it's going well. But the second she gets a text from an old guy friend, that ego comes out in full force and is going to crack the whip on her and become very unloving all of a sudden. And then things can expand from there into a nasty fighting and, and this and that. So that, that shows you that if hate is there in any way, true love was never there. Mm. It was just false love being um, masquerading right, mm. as real love. So that's like, you know, one of the classic ways we see ego show up is this possessiveness. And it's not just romantic relationships, but even friendships, ego will become possessive of. Um, you know, we could go on a, a myriad of different things, but that'd be the most easy thing, I think, for us all to relate to because we've all had a special relationship. I had tons of them, you know, before I came into this awareness. And so the, the question is, how do we move from a special possessive relationship to a loving relationship? And it's, again, it's that journey from solar plexus to the heart. I love that. As you're speaking, it's just resonating so much with me, so much with me and, and my relationship with Jen, you know, and yeah. some of the things that we have had to go through, even not only within ourselves, but in our own, in, in the relationship to like, to yeah. like live in that space. Right? right. Okay. And so how did this journey begin for you? Because, because, because you, you, you know, you're, you're speaking absolute truth right and 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 i think getting to a space where you can when you are aware of truth universal truth mm -hmm. that's a journey that's a journey oh, it is it's a it's a deep scary yeah journey right what was your journey like what where did it begin for you i grew up as a evangelical pastor's kid pastor's son oh i'm gonna have fun with this conversation. yeah did you grow up religious uh very Oh, nice. Yeah. What uh, denomination? Well, for me, it was first I was Catholic. Okay. And um, and then I graduated to Christianity. Nice. Yeah. And yep. then I I tried to save the world, obviously. And, yeah. <laughs> From hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Same in a lot of ways. Um, one of my guilt points as a Christian was actually the fact that I never converted anyone to confessing Jesus as their Lord and Savior, because I always felt this weird ickiness about it. I was like, this doesn't 
feel right to come up to a stranger on the street and ask them if they've accepted Jesus. I never did that either. Yeah, it just didn't resonate. But yeah. I felt guilty that I hadn't done that it. You hadn't done more. Because we're told in church, Can we go make disciples. Right. But it's like, if this was really good news that we were all really in full belief in, we would, you wouldn't even have to tell us to go make disciples. You know, we wouldn't even be able to keep it to ourselves. But it was like, my Christianity was almost like a dirty, dark secret at school and stuff because I secretly didn't resonate with a lot of the beliefs. I definitely loved God and loved Jesus and wanted to emulate and follow Christ. But uh, Christians, Christianity, not so much. And so I got to this place at 23 where I had graduated from Oral Roberts University in Tulsa with my bachelor's in music and theology to follow in my dad's footsteps, which I'd always wanted to do. And then I had this existential crisis of awakening where I was like, I got a job at a church as a worship pastor, full-time worship pastor. And this church was very different than my dad's church, our church growing up. My dad never preached a lot of dogma. He didn't ever preach about hell. He didn't like those topics either. It was always about the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the spirit of God. And so at this church, it was the total opposite. It was super dogmatic, super legalistic. And all they wanted to talk about was who's going to hell and who's not. And we've got to go save everyone because they're all destined for damnation. And I was confronted with this picture of God that I did not know. I had never encountered such a God in my heart. I'd never experienced a God like this. I got to this point where I'm like, I don't know who you're talking about here. Wow. So I can't be here anymore. Well, I, what was that moment like? Because I, I know that must have been like, right? I began at around 18 years old when I would start to read the Bible and read things, you know, from the lens of every word in this book was written by God's right hand. You know what I mean? Reading from that lens, I would read stuff and be like, there's no way like yeah. that definitely was written by ancient people who didn't understand science and stuff yeah so things like that started to wake me up but at 23 24 i couldn't keep it in anymore the internal conflict had just reached a boiling point and uh, there was three different things that happened at my church that really just broke me in that way um i'll tell one of them okay versus all three but there was uh we lived our church was in downtown san jose and it's a very, very busy, dense urban city. And there was homeless people that would sleep on the steps of our church. We had a big, huge, almost like cathedral looking church building. It's called Crossroads Bible Church in San Jose. And we would have homeless people that would sleep there every so often. And I always wanted to go like do the Jesus thing and like go out there and minister to them and bless them and pray for them and maybe even cast the demons out of them and stuff like that. <laughs> so there's this homeless guy out there one day and this was after the first two blow up events had already happened. And I was like on a uh, fingernails edge about to leave already and uh, see this homeless guy. And I'm like, I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> I was not healthy back then. So I had a hot pocket for lunch and knew nothing about nutrition. And uh, I was like, I'm going to go heat up my hot pocket for this guy and give it to him. And then I'm going to charge it with God's love so that when he eats it, the demons will come out of him and I can pray for him. And, you know, because he was talking to himself and all this stuff. And so I, I do this, I go heat up my lunch and I'm, I walk out to the front of the church and uh, there's an ambulance there and these paramedics are strapping the homeless guy into a gurney and my pastor's there kind of watching over this, the event and two cops are there and the homeless guy is screaming out. Um, and he was in the church at this point, they were wheeling him out of the backside of the church on the gurney and he was screaming out, F you church mother effers, F you church mother effers. And basically like calling out their hypocrisy. Like, I was just trying to sleep here, man. You guys get me arrested. Like, right. you guys are hypocrites. And my pastor was like, oh my gosh, I can't stand this vulgar language in the house of God. And the cops were like, come on, man. Don't you want to save it for outside? And I, was, I felt like Jesus turning the money tables over. I was, yeah, like, I was like, no, no, no. He's right. That's exactly That's what exactly we are. right. I was like, let him say it. And my pastor was like, what did you just say, Aaron? I said, he's right. That's what we are. Let him say it. <laughs> I was like, come at me, bro. <laughs> so wow. he was like, meet me in my office. And I was like, gladly, you know? Yeah. I knew I was quitting at that point. So I had yeah. nothing to lose. Um, kind of a breaking point. But um, anyway, I just told him like, look, man, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. I don't believe anything you guys teach here. I've been keeping that a dark secret from you all, but I, I gotta, I gotta move on with my life. And I know you guys just hired me. So to be your worship leader. And they were like an older church trying to get young blood in. And like, that's why they hired me. So I knew it was going to be hard for them to like not have a worship leader. 
So I said, I'll give you three more months to find a replacement. But like, don't but expect a have, lot of me. That must have ate you up Terrible inside. Terrible I, I know. I know. I was that. 23, bro. I know that feeling. <laughs> but listen, listen, to your credit, to your credit, to be, uh, I, I just, I'm just so grateful for this conversation right now because number one, you, you, how beautiful that in your journey, you had that awakening, that awareness at such a young age. Because for me, man, I was I was the 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 the, the good boy, yeah, right? Same. A and and I would not do anything. Like I I was the guy that when they said like, I mean when they said whatever they said, I was just like I'm just gonna do whatever you tell me to yeah. do, you know? And I'm just gonna be whatever you want me to be. Yeah. But then what started happening inside of me was like, but but some of this just doesn't feel right for me. You know, and then and then my mind would go, uh uh, you can't you can't think that. That's the devil. That's the devil. Yep. That's it. That's the devil. You can't uh 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 like cast it out or whatever. Yeah. And then I go back to living like normal, right? And then, you know, I, I I would start attracting a lot of success in business and, and a lot of just cool things. And I, you know, people would say to me, Well, like, God has really blessed you. And then I would think like, Well shit, like, didn't I envision it and didn't I in a sense, create it from those visions. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. The devil's in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then for me, the crust was like relationship and marriage. Like the whole concept of like, once you're in, it was like you're in. Yeah. And, and I had a pastor literally, t which I understand commitment, that's a different thing. But but I had a pastor literally tell me like, no, you 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 made up your decision and this is it. You're, you're stuck basically. You're locked in. You're locked in. And none of that felt like good in my heart. Same. Awaken your truest potential, heal any limitations within, and transform your life forever. That's right. In the upcoming weeks, Awaken is going to be coming to New York, London, Miami, and Palm Springs. I'm going to show you how to break your limiting beliefs, attract your dream partner, and show you to get everything you deserve in life. This is my flagship event that has helped thousands of people on their healing journey. And now it's time to begin or continue going deeper into yours. If this resonates with you, head on over to dannymorell.com backslash awaken now to get your tickets today. I got married at 23 as well. Wow. Yeah. And then divorced at 26. Because I, I went this way from Christianity and she was having trouble following me and that just really diverged our paths. So, I mean, I should have, I should have divorced that marriage right then and there because the writing was already on the wall. But again, I was 23, Sure, didn't know myself very well and was afraid. And you know how it is, right? Your entire family's Christian. Every friend you have is Christian. The entire society you've grown up in was Christian. I went to a Christian school, Christian college. I didn't know anybody who wasn't Christian. So it's like- if Who I'm, wasn't a Christian. Who wasn't a Christian. I, I know exactly what so you- So like I'm- mean exiling myself for my entire life and starting my entire life over. That's a terrifying thought at 23. I've been there. So it took me to 26 to finally say, I can't do this anymore. I'll blow up my whole life. Let's do this. You know, what was that moment like for you? Well, it was tough, man. I mean, there was, there was a lot of moments of breaking down and like trying to accept the inevitable, but it was a lot of things converging at once. The biggest one being, is there a God? Like I didn't, I thought there was, but maybe there isn't. And there was this period of like closet atheism for a while. And then I started, um, obsessively reading near death experiences to try to get like, if anyone knows the truth, it's people who've gone to the other side. Let's see what they have to say. And that really was what lifted me out of that season. Cause it was like this grand consensus amongst every ND I'd ever read almost the same experience every time meeting the source, having a life review. So that gave me hope. But then it was like, but then what is God? Is God like what I thought? Is God really loving? Or is God just this kind of like placid intelligence that doesn't care much about me? So I went on that journey into Eastern stuff and studied Buddhism and Hinduism a lot. And that's what brought me full circle back to kind of mystical Christianity and seeing Christ from a very mystical lens, um, marrying East with West in that way, really created a spiritual path that resonated deeply for me. Because I felt like the Eastern traditions, um, although they were very abundant in what I was lacking in Christianity, which is like the knowledge aspect, understanding the divine, understanding God, 
Christianity has got that all out of whack. It doesn't have a, almost a clue who, what God really is like. N none whatsoever. Yeah. But they have the feminine down pretty well in terms of the worship, the devotion to God. Mm -hmm. I mean, we worshiped God every Sunday, worshiped our butts off, and I loved it. Can I share something? Uh -huh. That for me was a big moment of awakening because at my church, even that, it was like a program. Yeah, and in it Catholicism, was like, it's not quite. No, that. no, I'm saying in Christianity. Oh, okay. It was like I could see like the 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 show. Yes. You know, cue this song, cue that song. Let's take them into their oh, hearts. Yeah. Let's the make them raise their hands. Like, I, yeah, I was I was at a mega church. Yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's some good to that, but um, I was lucky that my church growing up was we very much spoke ill of religion and the spirit of religion, and we didn't want anything we did to be um, too ceremonial and orderly we wanted it to be genuine and authentic so we would like we our denomination was called spirit filled so we would have services where we might my dad might never preach we just worship the entire two hours because we get into some some flow together people that, are running around the church and banging tambourines and we're having a blast that's kind of cool actually. yeah like revival type stuff so it would be different every sunday okay so i grew up in that like true open-hearted worship to god but I didn't know or understand God. So Buddhism, Hinduism really gave me this deep context of non-duality and understanding oneness, but it, it was eventually lacking the heart-centered devotional aspect, the feminine that I grew up in and missed. And so I started to feel kind of empty inside after seven to eight years of just studying enlightenment teachings nonstop. And I was seeking that heart-based consciousness. Mm -hmm. So again, it was marrying the two that really gave me you know, East and West or masculine, feminine, that gave me what felt like a full, well-rounded picture of the spiritual path. And so that's kind of the path I teach now. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. I, I have to know, what was that moment like talking to your dad? And is your dad still a pastor? Or how does it? I, mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, uh, he is still a pastor. Um, but when I came out of Christianity, it was really hard for him. I never had a conversation with him about it. I just kind of stopped going to church. You know, he was in California. I was in Oklahoma. So we were distant. And I would just, I started posting on Facebook here and there about stuff I didn't agree with. And we'd get into these crazy Facebook debates with hundreds of Christian friends of mine. And they, I mean, they'd be thousands and thousands of comments. I'd spend days at a time responding to every comment because I had something to prove, you right, know. Right, right, right. And so he would read those and he would start to get uncomfortable, nervous, concerned. concerned yeah. My, my son is is losing it. Oh yeah? Yeah. No, I'm saying, I'm, I bet you he thought my son is losing right, it. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he didn't confront me about it, but he kept it inside and had a lot of his Christian pastor friends come to him being like, have you seen the things your son is posting on Facebook? I'm worried about him. It looks like he's backsliding and yeah. all that. So to my shock and dismay, today, my dad is, as far as I can tell, totally on board with almost everything I teach. Wow. And he doesn't believe in eternal conscious torment anymore, the rapture, biblical inerrancy. Like he has a much more open view of those things now and a progressive view now, which I never thought um, I would be able to say in my life. Not that he was ever super fundamentalist or something, but you know, it's hard to come out of that viewpoint of religion. And I think it's because I didn't try to force my beliefs on anybody, especially not my family. I always kept it out of our conversation and would really try to meet them where they are. Like we would talk about Jesus when I would go over for Christmas and stuff. I wouldn't try to convince them of the law of attraction or anything like that. But I was posting YouTube videos and was building my YouTube page for many years. And by consequence of that, my dad would watch my videos. And I did a series at the beginning of my channel called Moving Backwards, which is still on my YouTube channel. And it was like 32 videos in a series of, I wanted to help give questioning Christians like, helpful, satisfying answers to these deeper questions of like, well, if God didn't literally write the Bible, then is it still a holy text or should we throw it out? Or is there some good there? How do we resolve that paradox? Because I remember what it was like to think in that super linear way. You're like, either God wrote it or it's terrible and should be thrown in the garbage. And it's, as you know, it's totally not that simple. It's mm -hmm. the Bible to me is a very inspired text, but what does inspired mean? Does it mean God wrote it with his hand? or God breathed wisdom into man over time to write eternal truths down. That's the way I see it. And so I very much have a reverence for the Bible, but I don't worship it like a God or a deity anymore. So like I wanted to make videos like that to help people get those 
uh, questions answered in a healthy way. Because I saw all kinds of my Christian friends who, as soon as they left Christianity, they're like, F Jesus, F the Bible, it's all bullshit. Yeah. And it made me sad because I'm like, no, it's not all bullshit, man. Yeah. There's a lot of gold there. Awesome. So he would watch those videos secretly, late at night probably. And uh, I think he was like, this makes a lot of sense. Like I unpacked the belief in hell, everything, in a very wholesome, spiritual way that I think is kind of hard to argue with if you're an open-hearted person. And so over time, he just started to see what I was really talking about, and we started to have conversations. And now we, we love talking about these things, and he's, he's fully open to all of it. Beautiful. I just got this feeling like I almost felt him being proud of you. I think he definitely is. Yeah. I mean, he tells me he is. Yeah. I feel that. Nice. I feel that. Like, I feel like I, it's, it was weird. I just had this vision seeing him watching you and watching essentially your words and your teachings, like, help him awaken mm -hmm. and him being so proud of you for that. Well, it's interesting you say that because there's even a Bible verse about this of like, um, the sons will teach their fathers as the fathers taught their sons. My dad was my inspiration growing up. He was the closest thing to Jesus that I had to look at as a role model. And my dad always had, has always had this like next level integrity. Like he wouldn't take a penny from a Coke machine, you know, always tells the truth, even to his own detriment and just a genuine deep love for God and heart for God. And I always wanted to emulate my dad's love for God and, and did because he modeled it for me. And we all have our limitations in our thinking. So at some point I surpassed those limitations he has, but then, you know, 20, 30 years later, now he's listening to my teachings mm -hmm. and saying, wow, this makes a lot of sense. And I'm pulling him forward in that way. So it's a beautiful like synergy that the divine uses these uh, father, son, parental relationships where like we're born into this world, we're fully reliant on our parents. They have to teach us everything. And and we grow through their their knowledge. But at a certain point, we can help them in, in the same sense. And that doesn't always happen spiritually in families, but in my case, it has. And I think there's like a silent recognition of that between us, um, which is a really beautiful dimension to our relationship. I love that. I love that. Man, I love this conversation because I remember, you know, for me, I was literally tormented because it was like if I knew this secret that like, like you said, like very much like you, my, my whole world revolved around Christianity. Everyone that I yeah. knew was a, was, was, a, was a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for a while there, yeah, there was that anger, but, but I, was, I was so afraid, man. I was so afraid to have yeah. these conversations. It is absolutely terrifying. I literally kept envisioning like, them coming to kill me like if i spoke out and just and, and shared this stuff you yeah. know and it's been a journey to even and i and i say this i know you'll understand this it's been a journey to get to a space where we attracted you on the show in this moment because this show and this episode would not have worked even a year ago mm -hmm. you know what i mean wow so so my, my question for you, and this is something that I, I, I have to ask, this is something that I know what my answer to this is. This is something that I think most people want to know. Is Jesus God? I love that question. Uh, so do I. And it's a resounding yes for me. Yeah. Um, the caveat is, so are so you. So are you. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get you home, bro? <laughs> Oh my God. Was that your exact answer that as well? That was my exact answer. My Out exact answer is so are you. My, you know, my, my, my exact answer is, uh, you know, I've, I always wondered what it would be like for someone to ask me that question. And my response would have been like, the answer to that question is yes. You're just not asking me. There's another question mm -hmm. to ask. There's a follow-up. There's a follow-up. Yeah. It, that's the that's what is, is inspiring about the person of Jesus, right? Is that Jesus demonstrated what is possible for all human beings to attain, spiritually speaking. And the, the difficulty for Christians to understand that is because Jesus didn't have, 
Hindu or Buddhist language to put these truths in. He had this monolithic Judaistic religion uh, language available to him that has only a picture of a separate God up there. We have to sacrifice animals to appease this angry God. Very, very distant and separate. And there wasn't a, a oneness or um, unity-based language for him to pull from. So he had to say things like, I and my father are one. Mm -hmm. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Mm -hmm. In my name, you will blank. And when he says in my name, he's what he's trying to say is in my state. When you reach my state. Of consciousness. Yeah. Or, yeah. Because here's the thing. Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, there's one qualification. Kill yourself. And of course. I get that. The yourself is your ego your self. Your ego self. Right? What other self could he have been talking about? Because he definitely wasn't talking about kill suicide. your physical body, commit suicide, because then nobody could be his disciple. Right. So it's like, ding, ding, ding. Hello, Christians. He's talking about ego death. If you want to be my disciple, you got to kill your ego. Right. And what does that mean about Christ? He must have killed his ego. Why would he ask his disciples to do something he himself hadn't done? So he was in a state where he wasn't identified with a body and a personality. He understood himself in that third domain of cosmic consciousness. I am aware that there is only God here. So that's all that I am and all I ever can be. So there's no person who's claiming to be God. The person is God. God is the person. A ray of light is the sun. You know what I mean? Just like nobody would say that the sun is a ray of light. So an individual person can't say, I'm exclusively God. Just like no single ray of light is exclusively the sun, but that's not what Jesus was saying. He was saying, I'm a ray of light coming from the sun. And when you realize that you're yeah. also a ray of light, you will raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons. That's right. You know? Absolutely. That was going to be my next question. Um, you know, how did Jesus create all of those miracles? You know, um, I love this question too. Yeah. Um, the supernatural is really the natural, but on this lower level of third chakra, third density consciousness, when we're identified as an ego, as a separate individual, there's levels and levels of perception not available to us that only become available once we rise in consciousness to that level, to that plane. And Jesus, one of his main messages was forgiveness and universal love. And he would go around announcing to people, hey, your sins are already forgiven by God. You just got to make sure you forgive yourself now because God's already done it, but you got to do it. And uh, Rudolf Steiner, who I'm sure you've heard of. I haven't actually. No? Okay. No. Rudolf Steiner was a writer in the 1800s. Phenomenal mind, kind of like a um, Walter Russell, Nikola Tesla type of mind. Um, he, he wrote some really great things about this that um, specifically when it comes to seeing auras, he would say that um, it's, it's very possible to be able to see people's auras, like visually, but you have to raise your consciousness to a certain level or frequency to be able to pick up those light codes and stuff. And the way he described it is you have to get to a place where you judge no man. You have no judgments in your perception because if your mind is saying evil, bad, jerk, idiot, stupid, wrong, then you're darkening your consciousness from the universe because that's not the way the universe is. That's not the way the creator sees anything. Bad, dumb, wrong, stupid, ignorant. God doesn't have those judgments. And so if you want to see the universe God created, you've got to see how God sees it, which is unconditional love. For everybody and everything. For everybody. So the path of forgiveness is what A Course in Miracles is all about. It says the path to heaven is through the person right in front of you. Mm. You can see them as the Christ, you are in heaven. And so that's what Walter, uh, I'm sorry, Rudolf Steiner said as well, in that you got to cleanse your perception from judgments. And truly, even in the most vile, vilest sinner, you see the divine in them. Mm -hmm. Then now you have full access to your own divinity. Because as you know, the second I denounce the divinity in another, I've shut it off in myself as well. Because mm. we're one. We sure. are the same divinity. So if I, if I refuse to see green in that person, I can't see green that I'm wearing type of thing. I'm blocking that color from my consciousness. So when you do that, he says, the visible light spectrum expands literally through your pineal gland. And you'll start to see the little um, light rim around people's heads. And every so often when I'm with someone, I can, I can look for it and start to see it 
very, very faintly. And so like, that's one example, right? Of how healing your mind. I'm seeing it in you right now, actually. I was going to say, I'm actually picking yeah, it up yeah, a little yeah. bit. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting, but whenever I find myself, whenever we have these types of conversations on the show, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's rare. It's rare. I remember it happened big time with uh, my buddy Albert. Do you know Albert? Love Albert. I mean, I, I mean, he, 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 you know. Yeah. But there's He's there's tapped. some people that are tapped in that when you have these types of conversations, like I I see it all around you right now. Does it have a? Do you pick up a color spectrum to mm -hmm. it, or just more mm -hmm. of a light? It's just light. Yeah. It's just light. That's the first way it shows up is just an illumination kind of, mm -hmm. and that's the uh, right the famous Christian depictions of the halo. That's right. And the glowing. That's right. That's because. You know, back then, without the technology and all the chaos of modern society, it was much easier to live a devotional life. Mm -hmm. And Rudolf Steiner's whole thing is you've got to live a life full of devotion to God to access those higher levels of consciousness, to get into that fourth energy center and activate it. Yep. Loving awareness of everything is what activates it. So back then, it was probably normal for people to see um, auras and, and the light aura around people's bodies. In Acts, as you know, there's that famous passage in Acts 2 where it says they all saw something like tongues of fire emanating above everyone's heads because they were all tapping into a frequency together where they could see the uh, the aura that's always there. Yeah. We just, in third density consciousness, don't have the faculties to really see it until we start healing that ego consciousness that darkens everything with judgments and separation. Mm. So why was Jesus killed? This, the second video in Moving Backwards is titled, We Killed Jesus. And the premise of it is, I actually go into the story of his crucifixion with um, Pontius Pilate. That, that whole story is amazing to me because it really shows like this, the parody of the idea that God killed Jesus. Have you not read the Bible, bro? Because when I read the Bible, it sure looks like the Jews did it. Because you have this, this crazy situation where Jesus is arrested, betrayed by Judas and all that, brought out before the, the Jews and um, Pontius Pilate says, I've, I've talked with this man. I find no guilt in him. So I will not kill this man. And they're just like, no, crucify him, crucify him. And this back and forth goes on. And he talks to Jesus again. And Jesus is like totally submitting to the moment, being like, hey, if they, if they want to crucify me, let them crucify me. And that makes Pontius Pilate respect him even more. He's like, yo, I can't let this dude die. He's like a legit right. good person. Right. And so he comes back out and he's like, I will not crucify him. He's like, but um, I have an idea. Today's a Jewish holiday where we typically release a Jewish prisoner to you. So Pontius Pilate was thinking, I'll pick the vilest prisoner we have and let the crowd pick between that, that guy or Jesus, and they'll obviously pick Jesus. And so he picks Barabbas, who is basically a serial killer uh, back then who'd been imprisoned. He was like, would you like me to release the murderer, the notorious murderer Barabbas, or Jesus, the king of the Jews? And the Jews reply, give us Barabbas. And he's like, oh, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> so the next thing he does is he says, okay, fine, but I wash my hands of this. I am not going to have this man's blood on my hands. Mm -hmm. And he has his servants bring out a bowl of water in front of the public and he publicly washes his hands and dries them off as a ritual to say, it's on your hands. And, he, and then he says to the audience, now let his blood be upon your hands. And the Jews reply, yes, may his blood be upon our hands and our children's hands. Oh. That's what they say, bro. And so he's like, all right. And he gives Jesus over to them and they take him through this torture ritual and crucify him. And to me, that shows basically they, they couldn't hang with his message. They couldn't, they couldn't, I, I they, they, they couldn't handle the truth in yeah. what he was saying because it was such a mirror back to them in their lives that they weren't at a place in their journey where they could understand what he was actually saying. Yes. And it was especially because the religious class of the day was extremely offended by his teachings. Oh, you know, oh, and, and extremely controlling. And he was constantly calling them out for their hypocrisy. All the time. Making fools of them publicly. Like you read some of these accounts of Jesus's back and forth and you're yeah, like, I bet you. Ah. <laughs>
So if you've been listening to my podcast for a while, you'll know that I'm a strong believer and advocate for plant medicine and its ability to awaken and heal the mind, body, and soul. It's a belief that is deeply rooted in my own personal experience with both ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms. And many of you for years have always asked me, you know, Danny, where do I go? Who can I trust? And there is only one place I would ever recommend or put my name behind, and that is Reunion. Reunion is a place where you could set yourself free from whatever is holding you back from living the life of your dreams. It's a beachfront, beautiful property that is in Costa Rica. And what I love about it is that it's not for profit. And this is the only thing that they focus on is the preservation and the safe utilization of these beautiful, wonderful medicines. And I only feel comfortable putting my name behind it because I am personal friends and have journeyed with some of the members of the facilitating team. Guys, I'm honored to have aligned myself with them to create the Higher Self Scholarship Fund. It's a fund whose purpose is in helping people who don't have the means to experience these medicines and yet have the desire to. And every time one of you books a retreat with Reunion, $100 from every booking is going to go into this fund and we will be sharing this money with people on a monthly and bi-monthly basis. So help me help others by using the code Danny Reunion when you go to register to experience your own life transformational journey. To find out more, go to reunionexperience.org and get ready. I, I want to I say something publicly that I think you will understand. When all of the dots started connecting with me, I had a moment of fear because the story of Jesus, the miracles he created, the healing the message of forgiveness, the message that we are all one. In many ways, I found myself in that energy giving the exact message that he was giving. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, Funny right? Funny how that happens. Funny how that happens. So then I had a moment where I was like, what the fuck? Am I Jesus? Right? Right? <laughs> it's my ego, my ego, right? And I start tripping out for a while like, Oh my God, no, but I, no, 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 I don't want all of that. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot, right? Yeah. Did I come back? It's your ego, obviously. Mm -hmm. And finally, I just started realizing it's like, no, dummy, this is, you're, you're where he was talking that anybody can get. You're where he was talking from. That's right. You're in the state, the in place. In that state, that's right. And our job here. How he comes back is through our awakening. Yes. And when we awaken and we reach that state, miracles start to happen. People start to heal. The, the, literally heaven mm -hmm. on earth oh, yeah. comes back. Oh, yeah. You know? And that's the beauty is that it's like when you see it and when you see his life, when you see the life of Jesus, not it is so beautiful, not from what someone else is telling you, not from what some, not from even what you read, mm -hmm. but, but because you are it, you are one with that frequency. It's beautiful. And like, I, I love Jesus so much more. Yeah. You know what I mean? Same. And, and I had to go through like, because of why. <laughs> Like, like, if you think about it, like, like how deep in love must you have been to know, to know that they're literally killing you because they cannot fathom the truth mm -hmm. and to allow yourself to go through that process. Yeah. Like. It's the ultimate ascension archetype to submit to and forgive your murderers while they're murdering you that's like the ultimate act a human being can ever commit to show the highest state of spiritual attainment i forgive my murderers even while they're murdering me not like oh i, I had this grudge i had to work through it was a trauma but eventually i got to forgiveness that'd be impressive no 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 ability to put them out of your heart even while the nails are going into the hands you know, so the Christ is this eternal picture because it transcends the person of Jesus. He, he represented something that is, again, available to all of us 
spiritually speaking, if we're willing to do what it takes to get yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And that's what bothered me, dude, about the Christian message was like, how does it mean anything that I just confess Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior and I've somehow attained some kind of salvation? I'm still suffering from all the same stuff. I still have all the same dirty thoughts. Nothing has actually changed. Nothing has changed. I'm still stuck in pornography. Yep. I'm still looking at other women. I'm mm -hmm. still drugs, secretly whatever. drugs, smoking, other judging right? people. As, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, now, now the ego feels even more righteous mm -hmm. because I said the prayer and I know what's right and your way is wrong. Mm -hmm. Christianity to me even drives you more into the ego, of course, more into separation and more into the energy of the very thing that killed Jesus. Right. Very much so. It's, it's all about you. It's all about you and you getting saved, you know, bro, make sure that is a clip because I guess, <laughs> yeah, that's a real, that's a real, yeah. Here's the irony, right? Is that Jesus, as inspiring and worshipful as the person of Jesus was, that wasn't what inspired Jesus, right? He, he, he was what he was because he knew I and the Father are one and not because he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Oh. He didn't have that. No. So how did he get there? Well, he earned it through spiritual effort and discipline and, and devotion. And so it doesn't mean anything to me that I say, I believe Jesus died for my sins. What, what has that changed? Nothing, it's just bro, another I'd be belief. Up there, I'd be up there five times. Yes. Like this time it's for real. And that's why people do. This go. <laughs> time I'm not going to jack off anymore, right? Yeah, this last time. time I, yeah. You know last Friday. Yeah, last that's time. It. It's yeah. over. It's over. Right? And then you got to go to the, the All altar. over again. Yep. Because it's not real salvation. No. Real salvation is you coming into the awareness of oneness with God such that you lose interest in sinful things, such that you have no desire for it's personal not a part gratification. of you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's the self Jesus said you have to die to, to be his disciple. And so Jesus was the figure he became because he reached that state. So the only thing that's meaningful to me is to follow the way of Christ. And that's what Christianity originally was. Originally. Christian means uh, like Christ, to emulate Christ, to follow Christ. Jesus didn't say, um, confess me as Lord and Savior. He said, follow me. And you know what I'm going to say publicly? Jesus never said the words, the only way through the Father is through me. There is so much ego in those words. There is so much separation in those words. If you can just imagine in life right now, you're trying to like get into a club or trying to get into a room or a or a special meeting, right? Or somewhere that you really want to go and there's this dude standing there. No one gets through this door but through me. What would you think? Mm -hmm. You would, that asshole. This guy's who entitled. Does, who does he think he is? Yeah. Right? And so when you can look at that and understand that there was no way, no way that Jesus Christ ever said those words, not because I'm saying them, go into your heart. Mm -hmm. Go into your heart and feel, mm -hmm. right? And a, and a massive awakening is waiting for you, if you can allow yourself. Yes. Well, so the I am, Jesus made all these I am statements. I am, the I am state is what is beyond the heart chakra. When you continue to ascend up the energy centers, you eventually reach a point where it becomes astoundingly clear to you that the only thing that truly exists is the I am feeling itself that everything that lives and moves has the same exact sentience in it of I exist and that that's what God is. And the Hindus of the East teach that pretty heavily. And there's a lot of evidence to the idea that Jesus traveled to the East to learn under Hindu masters and whatnot for those 18 missing years. I think he must have certainly done that because mm -hmm. he, there was no non-dual teachings available in first century Israel. So where did he get all these non-dual teachings from? Probably from the East, right? Probably from India or maybe Tibet. But nevertheless, Jesus came back at 30 years old with a completely new identity, which was I, I am. And the I am is where he spoke from. So I think it's very possible that he may have said that, but he definitely wasn't saying it as Christians think he was saying it mm -hmm. because again, he had already died to his personal self. Mm -hmm. He had died to his egoic self. So he wasn't saying, the only way to get to God is through me, the person. Because mm -hmm. how do you make meaning out of that? What does that mean? 
You have to arrive at some weird, bizarre theology where you say, well, it must mean he meant to confess his body as your Lord and Savior. It's meaningless. It mm-hmm. has no meaning. Mm-hmm. What he meant was the I am itself is the way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God but through I am. I am. You have to know that God is I am yeah, in you. I am. That's right. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> this is my You're favorite. Deep, bro. Yeah, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Gosh, I don't even know where to go from there. This is the topic we could I could jam on yeah, with yeah, you yeah. for hours, man. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me more about Jesus and, you know, I I haven't gone too deep into it, um, but I I I do know and I could see now because you know what? This is what I want to ask you. It's do did did your pathway involve plant medicine? Oh yeah. Oh, it did. Oh, big time. Because you see, for me, I I, I wouldn't be here without plant medicine. Yeah. What medicine? Uh, mostly psilocybin. Okay. For me, in my uh, mid twenties, when I was going through my dark night, left Christianity. My whole framework of reality gets inverted upside down. Is there a God? That's a dark place to be. Yeah, man. And then you yeah, add yeah, a divorce yeah. on top of that. Oh, bro, I've been. And then you add, I have no friends, and everybody thinks I'm a heretic. And is posting about me being a, be careful of Aaron Apke. He's backslidden. He's a heretic. Even if I didn't believe what they believed anymore, it still hurt my That's feelings. That's rough. That's rough. You know? Yeah. So all of those things at once. And then I moved back to California to move in with my parents. Huge bummer at 26. <laughs> and I had no friends because I'm living in the Bay Area. I was working at Google as a, a personal trainer. So you're living the Bay Area life. We're all in our little bubble worlds. I'm in my car. You're in your car. We get to our job. We go home. I didn't know anybody. So no friends, divorced, everyone hates me. Does God exist? All at once. Super dark. And I had this, you know, suicidal depression in my mind that I could not get rid of. I didn't want to be suicidal. I really like wanted to enjoy life and live my life to the fullest. But nevertheless, these dark thoughts were there. Like, it's not worth it, man. It's all hopeless, man. And so I was desperately seeking for answers. So I was willing to try anything. And I'd started listening to Terrence McKenna a bunch and a little bit of Timothy Leary, Ram Dass. And they were talking about psychedelics all the time. And I got fascinated with them because I'd never heard about these experiences as a Christian. I'd never heard you could take, eat a mushroom and meet God. No, neither did I. So I was like, let's No, I heard the opposite. You eat a mushroom, you're going to hell. You meet the devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I started doing psilocybin like, you know, once or twice a month, I would go up to the mountains in the Silicon Valley where I would hike find a little spot up on the hill overlooking nature and just take four or five grams of mushrooms and have these wild life altering encounters with divinity Beautiful. that showed me the truth and showed me what God really is like. And one of the things that was astounding to me is that God's hilarious and God has this very amicable, jovial sense of humor and doesn't take all this shit so seriously that I take so seriously. Do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that, that loosed me from those chains, man, of the the deep depression of everything so serious. And I, it, mushrooms reminded me how to laugh again, you know? So there were some invaluable gifts that that plant medicines gave me in those those few years. Beautiful. I resonate so much with that as well. For me, it was ayahuasca. Yeah. And for me, it was after my divorce. Um, and then after ayahuasca, it was mushrooms. Mine was after my divorce as well. Really? Never touched. I hadn't even smoked cannabis until after 26 years old mm. in my entire life. Mm-hmm. Do you... I have a feeling, I know your answer. Do, do you still find the need to sit with plant medicine? Every so often, yeah. Mm. Less and less, but um, I even just, I really enjoy every so often like connecting with some cannabis and reading like the Rig Veda or the Ribu Gita or some Sutra, Upanishad. Because man, the way that cannabis opens your kind of your consciousness to higher metaphysics and things like that um, will make those texts come alive in a different way. Um, I'll find like the Ribu Gita, for example, it's very repetitive. It's almost like reading a book of mantras and it'll repeat certain stanzas over and over to like drill them into you. Mm -hmm. Be happy always without the slightest trace of thought. Be happy always without the slightest trace of thought. Mm -hmm. And you're reading it at the end of every stanza. And in my normal waking mode, my brain tends to go, okay, I already read that. Skip, skip, skip. And I'm trying to read something new, something new. And they're like, no. Yeah, and it keeps stay going. Stay there. But when I connect with cannabis and I read texts like that, I'm like, 
absorbing it every time like oh be, be happy, happy always, always. <laughs> yeah so even just simple things like that yeah and cannabis is obviously a plant medicine um i i for a long time i took cannabis uh habitually because i had this um super profound awakening at 27 at at google actually at my work work job and uh, I spent this two week period in this kind of Satori state of like absolute cosmic consciousness and then slipped out of it and spiraled back down into my depressed state. And I, it was so painful. It felt like being cast out of heaven or something. And so I, I wanted to do anything to keep that state of consciousness that I was losing before my eyes. And so I noticed that if I would smoke cannabis, it would put me right back in that state. Mm. And so that's when I first started taking cannabis, first of all. And second of all, got very addicted to it because it was my way to stay in heaven type of thing. And after a few months of like wake and bake type of abuse of cannabis, it wouldn't, even cannabis wouldn't do it anymore. And then mm -hmm. the cannabis would actually bring up the darkness. So I had to stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had that kind of relationship with it for a while, but now it's just become this vehicle for consciousness ascension, whether it's breath work or reading a spiritual text. Cannabis is something that will always open that the age. doors. Yeah, yeah. The doors of perception, as William Blake said. I got you. I love that. Um, I have always thought about Jesus. And I thought, I know he did mushrooms. Of course. Yeah. I think that was very popular back then, especially for the, the, the order that Jesus came from, which was the Essenes. You have you with? have you read they walk with they walk with christ yes. by dolores and jesus okay. and the essenes and jesus and the essenes both, yeah. yes both of them yeah. and a few books about it as well which the thing that really blew my mind i think this might be no this isn't in the dolores canon one but they call jesus the nazarite jesus the nazarite or sorry uh jesus the nazarene, the nazarene. Mm -hmm. and every other every other village town locale back then they would call it it um Amorite, um, F Philistine, they would say it like that. But the old English way was to call it Nazareth when it was translated into the King James. And in the King James, they call him a Nazarene. And when you look into the, the Greek language, um, the, the city he was from was not called Nazareth. That's the King James description of it with the S on the end. It's called Nazar. That was the actual region in the Qumran Valley that Jesus was mm -hmm, born in. Mm -hmm. So it was called Nazar. And the Qumran Valley was notoriously, and we have lots and lots of historical evidence to prove this, that that was where the Essenes lived and had their kind of, uh, their encampment was out in the Qumran Valley, far, far away from Jerusalem, where the religious Jews hated the Essenes because they were very mystical in their approach and so they studied the kabbalah and all that yep, yep, yep. so they outcast the essenes so they had to make their their civilization in the mountains in the desert so nazar was one of the towns in the qumran valley so the reason that they called jesus the nazarene it's it's abbreviation of the nazar essene or an essene from nazar nazarene uh, yeah. versus nazarite or nazareth and it all of a sudden when i saw that i'm like it makes perfect sense and i started reading texts about it and when you study the rituals of the Essenes, everything Jesus did from baptism, laying on of hands, withdrawing to the wilderness to pray, on and on and on, prophesying, all of it was exclusively Essene rituals and things that uh, religious Jews did not no practice way. No and way. thought was evil and stuff. So where did he get this from if he wasn't an Orthodox Jew? He obviously wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's because he was like a God intoxicated Jewish mystic from the Essenes, from the yeah, Qumran yeah. Valley, yeah. who came to Jerusalem to try to give, to bring this good news of oneness. To everybody else. Yeah, that ultimately got him crucified for yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. It's fascinating stuff. Fascinating. Because it brings Jesus alive, doesn't it? It really does. Because for many of us, that's what we're doing now. Yeah. You know? Totally. Yeah. And it, it, and it brings us even closer to to him and to the energy. And, you know, when I read, uh, they walk with Jesus and Jesus in the Essenes, there were these wild moments where I thought like, and I'm, I'm sure this is, and again, this is not from ego. This is just from like, you know, when you're living from the space and when yeah. you feel when you, it's like, I know that's true. I know that's true. Cause, Gnosis. cause I know it, I know it in here, not here. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, uh, it's beautiful. That's Gnosis, right? That's also what the Essenes believed in was like 
direct experience of truth in in yourself. That's it. That's it. Is gnosis. That's it. Yeah. You don't have to find an encyclopedia to prove it or something. Right? No. No. Yeah. How do people start this journey? You know, people are out there. They're listening right now, and and I I have a feeling that this episode and this podcast with you, it's like there's like non deniable. Like if if you go into your self, you, you will feel that there is truth here. You know, maybe maybe it's gonna come be conflicting up here, but if you go in here, you'll feel. So where does someone begin? Because I know this journey, it could be a little scary. Uh, it, not, it could be, it, it is a little scary when, when, when all you've known has been this, 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 these beliefs, right? Where do you start? And do you mean like someone coming out of Christianity or just somebody starting a spiritual path? I would say, I would say both. Okay. Well, you know, that's the question I'm continually interested in as a teacher because um, it can be harder and harder to remember how to meet somebody at the beginning of the journey when you're sprinting down the path for so long. You forget like where people are when they're just starting out. And um, so, you know, I don't know exactly what the best advice would be because everyone is kind of starting from a different place. Um, some people may have had no spiritual background in their whole life compared to like you and I who grew up with although it was very dogmatic in ways, a deep spiritual foundation, right? Sure, sure. A love and a devotion for God. So it depends on where you're, you're beginning from. But I think basic spirituality is, it begins with the cultivation of just the simple fundamentals. And one of them would be like cultivating stillness, right? Just start there. Just start to watch and observe the activity of your mind more and more. And um, maybe the best advice I could give anyone is make love your own ultimate litmus test your ultimate like threshold for everything that you measure everything against and if it doesn't pass the test of love then i correct it and i requalify it or i heal it so watch your mind throughout the day and just notice thoughts that are self-critical or negative or judgmental or insecure or fearful and does that thought re uh, reflect love no then i forgive that thought i forgive myself you know that's a basic spiritual practice that I'm sure you feel this way, Danny, like as a spiritual teacher, people overlook the basics like crazy and they want to go to the most cutting edge stuff, but it's like the most bang for your buck is in the simple Still, things, yep, yep. doing the simple things every day consistently. Be That's how you ascend. Because it has to be hard and, yeah. and, and yeah. you have to tell me how to do it. Right. And there has to be a way, there has to be steps, there has to be a process. I, I would 1 trillion percent agree Go into yourself, stillness, quietness. When you when you think you can't keep your mind quiet, ask yourself why. Ask yourself what's underneath that. Tell yourself, speak to yourself. Get to a space of complete stillness and quiet, and, and you'd be amazed what happens just in that. Yeah. Just in that. And what's, what's all the noise for, right? What's all, yeah, yeah. And for the Christian. Yeah. Well, like, you know, if you're listening to this as a Christian and you've made it this far, congratulations. You must be progressive to some extent. Yeah. Or you would have flipped this thing off a while ago. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you're uh, assuming you're a questioning Christian, um, the thing that helped me, I think, Danny, was understanding there's this amazing line from the course. It's really like probably the most famous line from A Course in Miracles. You may have even heard it. And it's really the way that the course opens, like the very first page, it says, um, this entire course can be summarized in the following. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. And herein lies the peace of God. And it was that line that I read as a Christian, you know, somebody had said, have you heard of the course? I heard it's like a Christian text and it's, it reads like a Christian text, but it's not a Christian text. It, it's a metaphysical text that's using the Christian language, the Christ, salvation, atonement, the Father, Holy Spirit. It's using those terms to point to eternal truths, right? So it's not actually Christian, but it does coincide really well with Christianity because of the languaging. And when I read that, I was like, of course. It all there makes it sense. Is. Yeah. Of course, that's where peace comes from. What God created is eternal immutable, indestructible, 
God's power cannot be stopped by anything. There is no second power in the universe that can oppose God. So truth has nothing to be afraid of. So why not question everything? Question the hell out of everything you can question until only the truth can possibly remain. And that's how you find God. You don't find God by saying, I already know the truth. I won't question it. I won't question anything because questioning is the devil. That's how the ego protects, protects its belief system. That's, right. that's not how you arrive at truth. Truth is like, come at me, baby. That's right. Question me all that's day. Right. That's I'll take right. every shot you got and that's keep right. standing because I'm real and I'm true. Right. And it's the illusions that say, don't question, don't yeah. question. And, 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 if, and if you want, if you have been listening to this podcast for any amount of time, you would have heard me say something along those lines over and over and over again. That everything starts with your ability, your courage within to ask the questions that you are afraid to ask. Yeah. That's where freedom comes from. Freedom doesn't come from running. And not questioning is running, right? It's going into it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. This was... What a blast, man. My, my heart, my soul needed this, for sure. We're in the green ray, for, for sure. For sure, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. How do people get a hold of you? How do people learn more about what you do? Simple. Um, I'm just pretty much Aaron Apke everywhere. So AaronApke.com, YouTube.com slash Aaron Apke, Instagram, TikTok. That's where you'll find me. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much. Guys, what a show. Um, I, I hope you're still here. Um, because if you are, I think that there is definitely some incredible transformation happening within. Um, what I can say to you is there is nothing to be afraid of. There's actually a lot of joy in that transformation. There's a lot of beauty in that transformation. So just allow, just allow and know that um, you're going to be not only okay, you're going to be wonderful. I'll see you next week on another episode of The Higher Self. Thanks for watching this week's episode of The Higher Self. If you heard something in this week's episode that caused you to think maybe, just maybe, there was a higher potential for your life. Maybe there was a potential to earn and receive financial freedom, to attract the relationship of your dreams, or to improve your health. That's what we specialize in. We help wonderful human beings like yourself to unravel all of the limiting thoughts, feelings, and emotions that you've been living through so that you can finally tap into your life's truest potential. If you'd like to talk more about that, we invite you to join us on Instagram or Facebook and email us the word discover more. And when my team sees that, they will reach out to you, send you the details of how we could help you on your pathway to a life of abundance, fulfillment, and creating the absolute life of your dreams. Message us right now the words discover more now on Instagram or Facebook, and we'll see you soon.